you know, those two films define really two different eras. And, you know, what I observed was the, you know, the, the first one you shot on film, um, camera didn't move very much. Yep. Uh, the second one has obviously got a mix of VFX in it as well. So tell us about the difference between these two. One hell of a difference is some respects. As I said, at the end of the day, they are two crackingly well-written films, and they're half hours, and they're sort of iconic in some way, but the way of making them was quite different because of the time. Um, I will say that, very importantly, the film you saw, first of all, is all shot in camera, I think with the exception of some overlays, optical overlays, which are the laser beams, the titles. Uh, in fact, something I forgot about, the little sparks while he's fiddling with his trousers. Um, I think they must have been just a straight um, superimposition and the rain. But everything you saw on that film was in camera. That's how, how it was shot. Um, no rigs to be seen. Um, because back in those days, we didn't have the technology. We'd, um, we couldn't scan the film as, as you can now uh, to remove rigs or anything like that. So everything had to be hidden. It took a lot of ingenuity, maybe. Um, but at the time, we knew no better or no worse. <laughs> So that's how we shot it. Um, cinematography in its purest form. Um, going on to Robin Robin, I'm glad to say again, it has the same thrill when we were making it and actually having seen what we achieved, and I'm very proud of it, that everything you see there was created on a studio floor. So all the effects in that, uh, all the facts, all the difficult things we find in animation, uh, like fire, snow, rain, uh, the flames and explosion, which are normally difficult to, um, to actually create in animation, we actually reveled on the fact we were going to do it, and, and we made a feature of it. So everything in that film, all the flames, all the snow, are all hand animated, and it, mainly it's wool, because that's the sort of the look of the film, the characters being felted. We thought we'd go for that softer look. So wool <laughs> played an important part in that. So you imagine all the snow is animated by hand, the little woolen balls of snow animated on glass on a green screen. Uh, the snow mists the same, the smoke, uh, that's all animated in wool. Uh, the explosion itself, the shed, that was fantastic fun because um, I, I've always loved the idea. I think uh, you've done some with Wes Anderson like that, but it's to actually make a feature of not just putting an effect on there uh, from you know, a sort of live action effect, actually create it in the same manner you're creating the rest of the film. So all that smoke again is wool, all animated, all lit from within inside. So all the parts of that film are actually created on the studio floor, but we've actually managed to use the modern technology uh, of visual effects, is to insert those into the film in, in a glorious way. And it has atmosphere, which is something you're always trying to achieve on animation. And the atmosphere goes right into the depths of the film. How we achieve that, <laughs> uh, I couldn't totally explain to you because that's, that technology actually escapes me, but the VFX guys, who we work with very, very closely, would actually scan the, uh, would scan the whole image and we'd shoot it in stereo. Some of these scenes, we'd actually shoot in stereo. And from that stereo image, it wasn't not projected or shown in stereo, but from that, they could actually replicate the scene and actually layer something in the foreground, something in the middle, something behind the trees in the, in the background. So we can actually get all those handmade effects and actually integrate them into the film. I think one thing that I noticed in all these films and um, is that the... Uh, you know, the iconic sort of quintessential, uh, often Martin Parr-esque Britishness is deeply embedded in these films. And, and I wondered how you underscore that, you know, cinematically, because it's such a, a major part of Wallace and Gromit particularly. But I see it in the films. It makes me think of Powell and Pressburger. You know, I see Hitchcock. I see all these references that are deeply layered. I see Tetley Tea and how it pours and it's heavy <laughs> and, and it's been brewed too long. And, and all these things, they remind me of my own experience, my own bad behavior frequently. And I think that's a wonderful thing to have achieved. It's, yes, it's a difficult thing to, to actually to put your finger on what it, what it actually is. It's a nostalgic look with Wallace and Gromit in particular. Um, I get working with Nick, and I've worked with Nick for ages, you know, as, as Tristan did as well. There wasn't actually a, a clear instruction of what he wanted, but you, you sort of knew it by being with Nick, that he was the sum total of like his influences when he was growing up, you know, as it was for me. It's like, um, oh, British films. I mean, I'm a big fan of Sir Jack Cardiff and Dougie Slocum and the old healing comedies. Uh, uh, the thriller films, like the Hitchcock films, um, 
there's something about them that sort of gets ingrained in your head. <laughs> And, and that's what sort of came out of Nick's scripts and that. And we just talk about it. And they think, well, it's just something like sort of, this is a Hitchcock scene. Um, but in fact, this is a domestic scene. This is, nor this, is, this is normality for Wallace and Gromit. And that's the first thing in, in Wallace and Gromit's world. It is a nostalgic, normal sort of British world. And I don't know how else you would define that. Um, we had Jeffrey Katzenberg, um, when he used to come around to visit the studio, because when uh, DreamWorks were producing there, the were rabbit. He loved Nick, he loved what Nick was doing, but I don't think, being an American, he totally understood it. He would say things like, it's very non-aspirational, you know, why is he driving that old car? And we're thinking, well, that's, that for Brits, that's a good thing. And, he says, and that wallpaper, why has he got that wallpaper? It's like your grandmother would have. And we all looked around and said, yes, that's exactly what it is. That's what we like, that's what we love. <laughs> And it's just trying to create that sort of feeling of warmth in Wallace's his home. It's, it's something I don't know if you could do it anywhere else in Britain, is to actually do, <laughs> make a feature of that. I'm, I'm, you, when we talked earlier, you, you spoke about, you know, how you prep with, with Nick and how you often just both end up laughing all the way through. And so I think it's interesting to hear how, how do you prepare this? You know, do you storyboard it? Why do you laugh so much? And uh, explain us a bit the sort of, a pre-production process for a film like this? Uh, certainly was with that one. There certainly it is down to the storyboard. I mean, Nick is, is a fabulous cartoonist. Um, the thing I was always loved about him is his storyboards. Uh, they are, you know, they tell you everything really, full and, and full of great composition. That's something I'm always very you know, uh, eager to maintain is, is like those, those classic compositions where you can actually, you know, a, a performance can happen within frame it's a good way of telling the gags. But with Nick, I don't know, this, I, I mean, going back when, in the early days when I joined ours, I used to sit by Nick while he was drawing in his cartoon book. And I, this was years and years before Wrong Trousers. And, and he started giggling and he just showed me this little drawing he'd done, which was a penguin in a bottle. I mean, completely out of context. I thought, oh, what a funny image there. Uh, little did I know that it was, it was something brewing in his mind. And, and I think that fermented in his mind that, the script for that over many years uh, and by osmosis or whatever I mean you sort of knew how he wanted to play it but you always had to trust in Nick's sort of sense of timing and judgment but uh, particularly his you know, the first thing is his drawings and I mean moving on from those uh, me included just didn't realize that you've often got 25 to 35 different sets different uh, I don't know what you call them um, well, units, really. Um, it wasn't so bad on on the wrong trousers. I mean, there was basically, it was a very, very small crew, I mean, compared to what we have now. And I think, Tristan, if you remember, there was about half a dozen of us at the most, most of the time on the studio floor. Yeah. Which was yeah, two camera people, two, two animators, one who's the director, uh, the production manager, and usually somebody else, <laughs> which, which varied. We didn't have sparks most of the time. We didn't have camera assistants. Uh, we filled in our own forms. And we, had to, yeah, we had somebody who actually drove them to the um, laboratory at Heathrow. But um, <laughs> it was a very small sort of setup. I think, obviously, there were model makers and other people involved on the periphery. But on the studio floor, for about 14 months, I think we were shooting. Uh, yeah, it was a very close-knit community. But basically, um, as I understand it, every, you know, for instance, with Robin Robin, you'll have prepared the, the visual look prior because it's shared out amongst a lot of different yeah. lighting cameramen. You'll have worked out the color, um, the colors you want to use. Exactly. How yeah. you're going to emotionally underscore it, how you're going to define emotional beats. So it becomes uh, very specific. I mean, you've got to pass that amongst many different people. Uh, Yep, and uh, I will say the Robin Robin is, is actually quite small compared to most of the recent Arden productions or the feature films, uh, but vastly different to uh, Wrong Trousers. We had about up to 22 units running on, um, on Robin uh, with two directors. Now, when we started out, we had about three, I had about three months of testing, which was fantastic, and for a film like that, and that's why partly it did feel a bit like wrong trousers that didn't really have a template for, yeah, for what we were doing. We were actually discovering it. But for, uh, again, from Robin Robin, we had new characters. In fact, when I started, the characters hadn't been designed. We were still working on them. 
So we did months and months of testing. Um, lots of color tests, lots of focus tests, lots of um, different ways of lighting the characters, which is nice. Again, like wrong trousers, we felt part of the process of designing it and making it. Um, however, when it was up and running, we had, you know, I say, up to 22 units, and we'd only just started shooting um, when the COVID hit. So we had to shut down for, well, six, six to eight weeks. Within that time, uh, they rebuilt the studio for us. We had to space everything out. And unfortunately, we lost about a third of the crew. So I was about to get uh, a lighting camera to help me out. Uh, he did managed to do about one, one and a half shots, I think. And we had to let him go along with a lot of the art crew. So in fact, on that, I think I was coping with 22 units every day. It was quite, yeah. Quite Amazing. a task on there. And when I say units, some of them may be test units, but a lot of them are the, 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 a scene, a, a room set or whatever, or the one of the snow sets, or maybe two sets might be the same scene from different angles. But um, animation, as you understand, is, is a long-winded process. I think we were turning out um, about eight, eight seconds per animator a week on, on that, which is it's about normal. I try to work out on... Um, wrong trousers, and that must have been about 10 seconds an animator, I think. We, um, normally, for a feature film, it is about eight seconds per animator. So, because you're not getting much material, you have to have a lot of animators, and because, uh, because of that, you have to have a lot of units, a lot of sets, all working at the same time. Hopefully not all changing at the same time, because certainly one or two people, or even three people, wouldn't be able to cope with actually all that many turn turnarounds per day. But it's a lot of ground to cover. I mean, I'm amazed because it seems so seamless. I mean, I look at the Wallace and Gromit um, chase sequence, which seems an iconic element of almost any Ardman film. And it just seems like the most incredible, you know, action sequence. And yet it's all done in miniature. I mean, you really do get to play with the train set, Dave, don't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I was fortunate because I headed the charge on the, on the train chase in in wrong trousers and it's become a, a staple thing I, I, i've become the go-to guy for chases i think on subsequent Arden films uh again on that though again imagine we, we had no special effects on that we had hardly any if, next to, to no motion control we had some tr simple trackers we'd built which i think we were running off a bbc computer i think that's the only way you could actually work out the fairings on it but um there was no great technology which i think was the big advantage on the wrong trousers in fact having to do everything by hand particularly in the chase, uh, we had the camera mounted on, tra on camera dollies, and just in testing it out very quickly, soon, we soon discovered that the idiosyncrasies of, of having a, a, a bumpy old track uh, and some homemade equipment just made it all the more dynamic. I mean, if you look at that now, there's lots of bumps and out-of-focus frames and all, those, all that chase stuff. Uh, uh, and that, to my mind, actually helped make it. And since then, now, we have very, very sophisticated equi equipment at Ardman, uh, state-of-the-art motion control stuff. But it's always difficult trying to get that sense of vibrancy back. You have to try and program it in. I think you gave Jason moves. Bourne a run for his money on that one, personally. <laughs> I mean, for us who, li who like live action, you know, we're used to putting lights far away. And uh, whenever we have to light little shots, we frequently struggle, take a huge amount of time. And, you know, what I'm amazed about is the precision and the intimacy of which you light, you know, this animal and underscore emotions uh, on her face. And the same with, with, with Wallace. It's such a precise world. And can you tell us a bit more about that and specifically how you light it? Uh, how we light them, I mean, going back to the early days, I mean, the, the types of light we used to use were, were theatre lights more than film lights. We used a lot of profile lights, which is like, project, you know, like projector light with shutters on them we can actually focus in. Um, and precision is a key word on it, um, especially when we're working on different scales. Um, and also I will add that we quite often are working on several different scales in the same film. Uh, in Robin Robin, uh, that was the normal size Robin, which is oversized, which meant all the sets had to be oversized for this one. We had a half size Robin, and we had a Robin about that size as well for some scenes. So whatever technique we use for lighting them has to, yeah, has to go across the board. But um, I guess another question would be, you know, uh, sorry, I've interrupted you, but how do you relate to these characters? Because what we see on the screen is that they're human characters. They're 
they've got all the emotions and we relate to actors we get a lot of feedback from actors on set but you've got little dolls we've got little <laughs> that's a nice way to talk about them um yeah i mean it it, it does take a particular style of lighting because they are very non-human i mean i'm sure when you're working with say lighting phoebe or something um it's, it's fairly easy. It's good looking, good looking lass. But um, some of the um, some of the puppets I have to light, their eyeballs stick out. Uh, they ca their eyeballs cast shadows. They um, they got very large noses or beaks, and you have to try and underlight them. It's uh, you can't really approach it in the same way as uh, yeah, lighting a human a human face. Um, I observe none of you like cats. By the way, it's, it's obvious that Ardsman's cats is bad. Hey, cats, cats yeah. is bad in this film, but uh, yeah, but not in general. We almost did a, a, a feature film about cats, so we're, we're not anti-cat. <laughs> uh, but tell us a bit more about lighting these things, sorry, because I interrupted you there, and, <laughs> um, and particularly lighting their faces. I think you know you brought up Phoebe, but lighting faces is so critical for yeah. all of us. I mean, obviously with the puppets, the plaster scene there, you you haven't got you know you haven't got any textures of the face really. It is it is shape. Um, that's why I always tend to use. Um, a lot of backlights, a lot of kicker lights, just to try and emphasize the shapes and things. Um, it's also you have to be very careful how you frame some of these characters as well. Uh, Gromit's quite good there. You put Wallace at the wrong angle, it looks like an old potato. But, um, <laughs> uh, but yes, there's a cert certainly a different, yeah, different techniques. Than the these felted puppets were fantastic. Um, and this is why it was such a joy doing Robin. It, it is quite new territory throughout. But again, uh, a lot, of, a lot of rim lighting, rim the hell out of them, I say. Um, it actually really helps bring out the shapes of that. And felt is particularly, um, is particularly interesting there because you can almost paint with light on it. I mean, a lot of those scenes there, there's a lots of different kind of lights coming from all angles just to get some of the shaping in the face. Um, the emotional part of it, we do relate to them as, as proper characters, but that's down to the skill of the animator. I mean, they do bring, the, yeah, they bring them to life. Well, I, I mean, when I watch Shaun the Sheep, which I still watch, thanks to my daughter, uh, quite regularly, uh, you know, Shaun has very specific character traits, and so does the farmer, so does Bitzer, and, um, you know, you bring them out again and again, but they're very varied, and I'm, you know, I'm amazed by, you know, how you do that, and cinematically as well. A lot of it's in the framing, it would seem. I think a lot of it is in the framing. Um, I mean, Shaun... Short, the sheep are buggers to light, I'll tell you, because they're, they're <laughs> black faces, white bodies. We spent ages getting the right tone of wool on them there because um, they're, they're not naturally easy to light on, on, on a colored, big colored set. Um, yes, and getting the character out of them, I mean, it's all about how, a lot of the interaction is what happens within frame as well. I mean, the great thing about Shaw and the Sheep, which again is, I think, a gift of cinematography, is it is silent comedy. It is very reliant on visual humour and placement and, yeah, and movement within a frame. I mean, one of the questions, and it doesn't necessarily relate to cinematography, which is that, you know, you've got animals who don't speak, you've got silent films, creature comforts, you've got humans telling you awful stories about uh, their lives with animals speaking them. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the humour and the distortion and the eccentricity that underscores this is is amazing it's very fertile brain territory and yet what i'm amazed is is that you've done deals with huge american the biggest american hollywood studios and how have you walked that tightrope dave because you've been there <laughs> 35 years and ardman has done incredible things in this way and yet has its integrity well, it's the writing and the animation i mean for our parts i think what we have to do is we have to make that world real I mean, in the cinematography um, we have to make it normal, and we have to make it normal uh, so everybody believes in it, that you stop questioning it, and once you stop questioning it, um, you can do what the hell you like. So you can have these most ridiculous chases, like a pantomime horse chasing, yeah, you know, a load of sheep inside a pantomime horse chasing around the town, um, bathtubs going downstairs full of, you know, full of characters. It, it's, it's trying to create a reality, and then, then allowing the cartoon world to take over there. And we do struggle, we, we, well, we would say we struggle. We work very hard to make it believable, but also we can actually indulge in uh, what happens in a lot of Nick's films, certainly, is we steal genres. You know, it can be hammer horror for a woman. It, sometimes it can be even worse than hammer horror. It could be like sort of a, a, a psycho drama, which I, I found in one of the, the last half hour Wallace and Gromit's, I found was getting quite dark and frightening, really. I mean, the, the, uh, 
a lady who was going around killing bakers and, and putting trophies in her bedroom. Is uh, yeah, uh, it's good family entertainment. Um, <laughs> but we have to pull that off so you don't question it. Um, it is a, a real world. I, I read a quote. I think it was for Robin just just the the other day and. They say you want to create a world that you actually feel you want to put your hand in there and touch it. You can feel it and touch it. And I think that's what we do. It, that's the great thing with stop frame animation as opposed to any other animation. It is real. These, these characters are there. And that's what people like to see. I know these, when you actually see them there, you can actually sense their textures. And this is what drives us as well as how do we light things. It's like you look at this scene and you think, oh, there's some lovely textures there. Or I want to bring the, uh, the, the, the fur wings out on this robin here. All that stuff there makes it desirable to, you know, to watch. You know, it seduces the audience, I suppose. So. I mean, you talk about genres, and you know, I see a lot of uh, uh, the use of colour in the second film, and it made me think of Powell and Pressburger, and yes. I know you're fond of them. So tell us about that and the use of colour in that film. Uh, well, Robin itself, I mean, it's a, a cinematographer's dream, really, because it does rely a hell of a lot uh, on the use of colour, the use of light, um, to tell the story. There's a lot of mood changes throughout that. And I've often avoided it in the past when we talk about sort of colour arcs and all this stuff, you know, things are planned out meticulously. It was sort of very important on this film. Every little detail um, was talked about and tried and thought about. And it's sort of what I like to call like the, the poetry of cinematography, is like when you can actually suggest things and actually ignite the imagination rather than show everything. I think it's so important, but that does mean you've got to get everything right. You've got to get the right colors, the right shape, the right composition. Um, it takes a while, and I think that's what we, we spent most of our time on, on, on the Robin film, is just getting those right elements, um, which I think is, yeah, is, is a great thing to do. Don't show everything, you know, suggest a lot of it. Um, make sure everything is right, because particularly in stop frame animation, you have to make everything. We can't go on location. Uh, you can't really go to the shop and buy something that's the right size, although some people have tried. Everything has to be made, so everything is considered. And certainly on Robin, we, spent, we did spend months and months just trying everything out. It's like being at art college, actually, and it was great at one point, because the directors didn't know exactly what they wanted. It was a, a, a if you use that horrible phrase, a journey of discovery, but it was for all of us. So they were drawing things and saying, well, maybe try making it in this shape. So I kept getting brought all these objects like leaves and uh, uh, nuts and berries and all sorts of things that might be addressing the scene. And I would just stick them in front there and light them from different directions. In fact, at the end of the day, it looked like some crazy pop video. I said, we'll just run this thing then. It's this one object was like, from what, and they could pour through it and say, "Oh, that's the right way. Oh, that that works with this sort of lighting, and this is the right shape." And now we've, we've think, start thinking about the colours that go into it. Um, I mean, in a way, like the colours were incredibly important. Yeah, and I, and it comes through. You know, I get the change of moods, and it moves me along. And as you said, when they they jump between shadows and or between light shafts. Yes, it's it's nice. I was light as a character. I mean, that's again. We yeah. didn't want to show the humans. Um, Unfortunately, we showed them more than we wanted to. We had to have a scene where they're slightly out of focus. But basically, they are there as silhouette, casting a shadow, or in fact, more importantly, a light source that yeah, that the um, the mice want to avoid. And uh, the first one was shot on film, 35. Yeah. Uh, the second one was shot on a Canon D1, I uh, believe. One, one DX, isn't it? One yeah. DX. Yeah. Um, for all of us cinematographers, we've had to you know, transition between film and digital. And when we were talking about this earlier, I think there was common ground between us live action cameramen and, and you. And tell us about that, because uh, I think it's an interesting, it's interesting to hear, see the transition and also the inclusion of VFX, yeah, but also I, how you operate. Yeah, I, I, well, I, we, tr we transitioned, uh, I think it's about, 2008 on the on the last Wallace and Gromit half hour, uh, I did have to be carried screaming and shouting because I I, I, <laughs> I was brought up with film. I just loved it. Yeah. Uh, I always thought that actually film was part of the magic of say Wallace and Gromit. I thought the film grain was what helped bring it alive. But uh, having established a look that Tristan myself had developed you know, from the early Wallace and Gromits to 
uh, to Were Rabbit. I thought we'd never get that back again if, if we didn't do it on film. Uh, fortunately, we found a camera, the, uh, the Canon cameras, that actually did hold that colour palette. I did some tests on there. On, I just used Wallace's sitting room and put a Nikon camera in there. We took some shots. The reds in the wallpaper were just oh, awful. <laughs> so right now, we, this one's not going to work at all. But um, I did persist and we did try other cameras. And Yes, it's, changed, it's certainly changed our way of working a hell of a lot. It's a lot quicker, obviously, to, um, to do changeovers. The one thing I don't like, which I think most cinematographers will say as well, it, it's opened it out a bit too much. It, although it seems to be quicker to be shooting digitally, it involves too many more other people. I think everybody else has an opinion about it now. Everybody can see the image. <laughs> very we quickly have the same problem, and, I believe. And, and can stick their oar in. Whereas I, th I did feel more secure, in, in fact, in being able to contain what the look of the film was in the days of film. But I know it's kind of killed a bit of magic for us that you could you could hide it until the next day. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe we should open up to questions. I don't know, Dave, is there anything else that you would like to say before we open up? No, no. Oh, I will mention as well, Max Horton, our colorist is in the audience here. Does he did a, a fabulous job on, uh, on Robin. Uh, so, uh, anybody got a question up there at the top? Hello. Um, sorry, um, uh, pardon me for prefacing my question with a cliche, but um, Art Man was a big, really, really big part of my childhood, so thank you very much, uh, which I guess is part why I'm studying film today, so thank you for inspiring me. Now, my actual question. Um, what seems to be a very big difficulty in uh, stop-motion films is to not make the world feel contained in a vacuum, like puppets in a big amount of nothing which seems to be hard to do, which obviously you know uh, how to make it feel alive. And it seems that difficulty, to me it seems that difficulty was the reason why early Artman films leaned into like scary a bit more. I, I remember wa uh, watching Not Without My Handbag and oh, Loves Me, Loves Me Not when I was six and that was kind of scarring but was awesome. Um, how do you go about making it feel like a c complete world and not like something in a vacuum? I think as soon as you take a project on, you have to believe in it. And um, I've said this is something that's always very important. The world we create um, has to be believable. It's one of the reasons uh, I'm wary of using a lot of visual effects you know, from outside on our films, because they give the game away. If we were to put any live action stuff into our films, it, it wouldn't look right. Once you start a project, whatever it looks like, you just have to define your territory and, stick, and really stick with it. Uh, it's it's the filmmakers who make it believable. I think you, know, you, you just can't. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you just have to believe in it yourself. The people making it, and we believe all these characters exist. <laughs> we know where they live, and yeah. <laughs> Next they question. Their milk. Um, I was going to ask, in terms of like framing, composition, and lighting, what happens if you change your mind on a shot after they've started animating? How do you go about that? Because obviously, I imagine if they put a lot of time into starting <laughs> it, or do you ever do that? Do you ever suddenly go, oh, maybe I could move it slightly <laughs> to the left? Because I know live action, that's no, we all you, do. But yeah. No, you're not allowed to change your mind during the middle of a shot. And I will tell you some, a fun, well, a slightly funny story on, um, on Robin. The directors were so keen on thinking about it and working out all the while. We'd started a shot, which um, it was taking weeks and weeks to shoot and set up, which is the track across the kitchen. I don't know if there's all the mice jumping across. I tried to show a bit of that on that little bit afterwards there, because it, every, every mouse has got a rig on it, and all that had to be painted out. It took ages to do it, ages to set up. And we set it up. We're halfway through the shot. And I, I came in one day, well, somebody called me to come. He said, can you go into the unit? One of the directors was trying to change the end of the shot. He was trying to change some of the objects around. Because he, in the, in, the few, in the few weeks it took to do the shot, he'd been thinking about it. And he thought, oh, wouldn't it be better if that was at the end there? And, um, and I think he thought that because it was such a long shot, he, and it's like the runaway train hasn't got to you yet. You can actually change things there. I had to tell him off. And I said, no, no it, it, it's going to change the lighting, the shadows and the stuff. You can't change it during the shot. <laughs> 
I think you must just tell us about Helena Bonham Carter here at this point. Oh, well, we did, yeah, we always get, yeah, when we get the stars visiting, um, the, the, the voice artists. Uh, yes, we did have Helena Bonham Carter during um, Wear Rabbit. I think we were mid-shot and she came in um, and she was very enthusiastic about Gromit, who was actually on, on a little plane chasing around the Tottington Tower. Uh, and she, yeah, she, she picked it up, started playing with it. We didn't have the heart to tell her we were mid-shot. In fact, it wasn't a proper shot. It, it was more of a test, but she was lovely. I mean, we, didn't, we just didn't want to tell her. I said, yeah, you, you play with that, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Nick. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, in terms of previs. Um, and storyboarding and animatics and all that kind of stuff. Have things changed a lot between the time you were working um, in the early on film? Um, and how did you go about particularly on the Robin project? Was there any digital um, uh, previs done on that to, to lock down the, 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 the flow of the images you were going to be working on? Uh, no, I don't think we had any digital stuff on Robin Robin. Uh, all of them always are heavily dependent on storyboarding. It, it's, it's crucial, obviously. Things have to be planned out. Things have to be built. Uh, but things do get changed during the shooting. Um, as, uh, and on some films, I think on the Pirates film I worked on, that was incredibly heavily uh, pre-visualised. It was almost in the computer. I mean, most of the shots on there, the directors were actually working it out somewhere else. I don't like that, but um, <laughs> I, I like to be there with, you know, with the directors doing it. But uh, it, it varies from film to film, but the, um, certainly the storyboarding is of paramount importance. The um, wrong trousers, it was like a, a very simple storyboard. It wasn't really animated that much. Uh, I don't seem to recall them. Um, some of them are, are drawn, but heavily animated. So, you know, it, actually in edit to get all the timings right and... and, and uh, well, you know, get the edit points right. But uh, Robin was actually, that was fairly loosely storyboarded uh, and quite often changed uh, while we were filming. They'd, they'd come up with better ideas. I think when we started out, for example, they didn't have the exploding shed. Uh, that got introduced at some point. Um, but you've always got to have a basis to start with, really, so you know where you're going. Uh, although Ardman films are notoriously, when you're working on them, they've never worked out the ending until you're about two-thirds of the way through it. So, I mean, that's, that quite often happens. <laughs> uh, usually to their benefit, but, um, but storyboarding, yes, it, 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 crucial for animation. So, just, um, uh, just to dig in there a little bit more, um, in terms of the style of the storyboard artists in relation to what you can achieve on lensing, I've seen sometimes that storyboards, you know, have, have a lot of energy and a shpow kind yep. of stuff. And then when, it, when, when you're lensing that, you can't achieve that. You have to find somewhere equivalent. And sometimes it can be better, sometimes it, you, you can't achieve that. How do you go about um, thinking that stuff through to make sure you don't get caught out by the, uh, uh, the, the style um, the artistic style yeah, of the... It constantly happens, and we keep saying, well, it's the magic pencil. It, it's, it's something, it, quite often it's the timing as well, because it's not thoroughly thought through on the, on the drawings, and that, the actual timing of things, or the way that things are positioned, the way that the p perspective is drawn in some of the, the, the storyboards I've had. Yeah, it's just impossible to, to reproduce. Basically, you've just got to get the spirit of it, really. Um, but also what we do have, as well as the storyboards, quite often we have lots of colour artists now who actually do scenes from the film and actually start working out the colours. And that, that we had on, um, on Robin. A guy called Jose Prats did, um, did some beautiful, I mean, they're like works of art, they're all paintings, that, that actually gave us inspiration for a lot of the colours in that. Although we didn't always stick with them, um, it was a very good starting point. And I think that was, in some respects, as, as important as the storyboard itself, is to have all this visual material. Um, Obviously, animation takes such a long time to, to try and work out what it is you're trying to achieve in advance is, is paramount. But um, then again, I also, on top of that, I will say I do like to have the space that you can improvise within that. And I think when all the crew are involved, which is you know, the, the set dressers and the cinematographers and that are actually involved in that storytelling, it always benefits it. Any other questions? 
it, it's sort of really about how you um, cover a scene um, and and how you get to to um, do do you do you have a a, a kind of a um, a, a previs rehearsal where you you'll do maybe every tenth frame or every twentieth frame in terms of the move um, to make sure that the camera's going to be in the right place or the character's right. going to be in the right place yeah. um, and then you go back and start doing it frame by frame. C certainly, yes. I mean, what, if you you give them the board, you set something up, um, you set any camera moves up maybe that are needed. Quite often, I mean, I like because I used to do a bit of animation, I'm really awful at it, but I do like to actually <laughs> play with the puppets as well and actually do a quick block myself, quite often to find out where the light's gonna lie. In fact, I often go into a, a, a scene, I know what's supposed to happen, but I'm, I have no idea how to light it really until I actually get there and start playing with it. I mean, I hate to go in, I like to pretend I don't know what I'm doing, and some people say I don't, but um, I like to go in and be surprised at what, uh, what the set has to offer and, and start playing with it. So I will have a little fiddle, I'll have a little block. But the animators generally on a, on a feature film, or uh, we won't do it on the TV stuff because the turnaround is so quick, they'll always block a scene out. So it's like a dress rehearsal. So they'll chat to the director, they'll then block it out, with loose lip sync in there, but not just moving the puppet out or anything like that, but you know, fairly rough, maybe shooting on fours as opposed to twos or whatever, you know, four frames at a time. And that's great for us as cinematographers because we can actually really see what's going to happen. We can see the marks, we can see where the puppet's going to end up. And generally, they're very good at doing that, at actually repeating their movements if that's, you know, if that's been accepted by the director. So that's of enormous help to us when we're lighting. Does Wallace hit his marks regularly? Hmm? Uh, Wallace is a dozy old bugger. He does. I don't. Yeah, he does actually mostly hit his marks. So, yeah. Um, Anyone else? Yes, uh, Ardman used to have the largest collection of Mitchells in the world, I believe, <laughs> fifty. Do you ever use them today? And what are your feelings when you do? Uh, sadly, we don't. Um, to tell everybody else how we said we, we started off at Arden's with a ragbag collection of equipment. Um, we had, I think, when we shot uh, Wrong Trousers, we had two Mitchell S 35s, which weren't perfectly light type, as you could probably see in the film. <laughs> um, when we actually we, we did the close shave, we, we upped everything and got sorry, you were gonna. I would just like to say there are some shots in Wrong Trousers that were shot on a Newman Sinclair, yes, that had been rigged under the wing of a bomber. Well. Constant. Yes. Converted it from clockwork to manual and put a bell and howl mag on the top. Yeah. And it leaked like a sieve. Yeah. <laughs> Was that the one that Adrian Biddle laughed at? Do we? Oh, yeah, well, I, yes, I have a little story about that, that camera, which, uh, I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just throw that in as well. Very early on, we would do, we used to do lots of commercials. We did several at Pinewood Studios, um, usually part of a, a live action thing. We did one for access credit cards, I think, which is live action, but it had an animated scene on a tabletop, whatever. With Nick Park came along and animated it. We went up to London, they just shot all their live action stuff, uh, and, and putting their gear away, so we, we could move in and put our puppets in there and start setting up our cameras. One of the cameras was that Newman Sinclair, which is a lovelier camera. He said it looks like it had done service in World War II. It, the door wouldn't shut properly, so it had a big G clamp up wrapped around it. When you got the film in there, you had to put the G clamp on there. Uh, it was so leaky that you had to put a big blanket over it when you were shooting. Anyway, we got there, so we're setting our gear up. Adrian Biddle's team were you know, putting their gear away. I got out our tripods, which is nice old wooden tripods. Got the tripod out there. Howls of laughter from the, cr the, the live action crew. Well, where did you get that from, antique shop? And I, and I, was, I was a bit embarrassed and I thought, I'm not gonna get the camera out just yet. <laughs> I waited till they'd all gone home, and um, set it all up. I think we had two missiles and this Newman Sinclair, put the blanket over it. And out of the whole commercial, actually, the shot we shot on that was, was the most used shot. It was, it, was, it, was a, it was a cracker. The camera worked perfectly, but um, we, I think back then, that was be, be, before um, Wallace and Gromit and that, before, yeah, we, were, we were just some sort of uh, hick crew from them, a village in, in the West. <laughs>
But the other thing was, every time someone was shooting a commercial in the studio, we had to give up one of the Mitchells. Yes. So then we had to use the savers. We were, like, we were super low budget, and the studio had to keep making money by shooting commercials. So we would lose kit. Yeah. And time could. yeah, can you imagine that, this, this iconic film here? And they, they couldn't afford to pay us very much as well. Um, it was a 40-month shoot. So they said, well, we'll give you a commercial to do every now and then to make up your money. So every, every now and then we'd nip off to the other studio and shoot a commercial, <laughs> then go back onto the trousers. Sorry, but to answer your question, um, when, we, when we got to do the feature film, we were given loads of money. We had a really good deal with DreamWorks. Uh, I mean, it had to be. We, Spent two years setting up a new studio, had to fully equip it. And we'd been using these old BNC, our Mitchell BNC, our 35mm cameras, some of them going back to the 30s. Uh, we loved them. Um, there was a guy in the States who was still working, and then ex Mitchell employee who was actually, so he, he was rebuilding them. We went around the, the world buying up old Mitchell cameras, uh, got this guy in the States to, to modify them for stop frame, make them very light proof. Uh, and we ended up, and I think, I think we've probably got 50-odd um, Mitchell cameras. We've got the largest collection of Mitchell cameras in the world, I think. Uh, they're beautiful machines, absolutely fantastic. Uh, but they're not used at all, and I don't think they ever will be, because it, it would be too cost, costly, I think, now, apart from doing it as a hobby, is to start putting film in them and, and getting it processed. What's happened to them? Uh, Tristan's got one, I've got one, various <laughs> the crew have got them, not to keep, we are curators of them, just to <laughs> keep them on our shelves, to keep them alive, to keep them looked at. Um, but um, if anybody wants to start shooting, um, 35 mil stop frame, I'm sure we could work out a way of you, you, know, you, you borrowing these, these cameras. But they are, they are works of art, they are, they are such beautiful machines. Yes, yes. last question here. <laughs> so I kind of have two questions. Um, the first question is about the organization. Oh, sorry. Um, Can you just start again because we're yes, recording? Yes, So I, I have two questions. Um, the first question is about characterization on uh, wrong trousers. So I suspect that the, the penguin is a penguin, but when he puts on the hat, he's more of a uh, criminal mastermind as a chicken. You have That's sussed like, it. <laughs> right, right. Okay. All right. So, so my second question is more about uh, texture. So um, my, my favorite film by your work is uh, Chicken Run. Yeah. And I love the mud and the dirt and the rain and like the sweat you put on the characters. So my question is, how do you figure out the textures when you're doing land like stuff like rain, snow, mud, dirt? Uh, that's for all your films. I'm pretty sure it's a process and they vary, but um, I'm really fascinated by how you make natural elements fit into a like a stop motion animation film where everything's clay. Yeah, well, that's as I, as I say, that's part of the art. And um, if you were to just put uh, real live footage in there, like uh, superimposed you know, an explosion or flames into some of our films, they wouldn't look right. It has to, it has to all look like it's from the same world. Uh, in Chicken Run, I think, just trying to remember what we actually had in there, there was rain effects, which were done with CG. Um, there's lots of mud in there, but that's, uh, that's down to the set dressing. I mean, it's an interesting film that was, I, I, I like to call that, was it Fifty Shades of Brown? I mean, that was, that was, that was the color palette for <laughs> a, a lot of that film. Um, which is quite important on that film, is actually as our first animated feature. I certainly didn't want it to look like a Disney film. I wanted it to have a sort of an integrity of, of tone, really, that was, you know, that was of, of realism, really. Yeah. So it is a, a, a very brown movie with you know, <laughs> some exciting colours that come in at certain points. But, but yeah, in terms of the... Um, of the, although those elements, as, I say, as we did it in, uh, in the Robin, we made a feature of them. We didn't try and make them super real. We made them of that world, and that's, that's the thing. And in Chicken Run, I think they are sort of fairly realistic in that. The biggest problem I had in Chicken Run is that working with the visual effects people is we had a gravy explosion. And I was trying to explain to them, um, well, it's an explosion, but it's in gravy. And it's like an atomic explosion, but in gravy. I mean, they tried about, I mean, it's been about a dozen times, really, giving us different versions. I say, well, actually, it just has to look like we've done it. And if we did it, we would do it in clay you know, or plasticine. Uh, can you make it look like that? Because th th back then, the sort of natural project of, of, of visual effects unit was to make things super realistic. But I say, in our world, it, it's super realistic, but only in that world. It has to apply to, yeah, to that environment. It has to look right. Uh, a, cl a classic thing as well, actually, we saw in one of the 
in the wrong trousers there is um, pouring tea, as you say. It's, a, it's become a sort of iconic thing on Wallace and Gromit. It's a very simple thing. It's, it's, it's cellophane paper, stained sort of brown and just animates it as it comes out of the, um, of, of the teapot. But that's, that's how tea looks in Wallace and Gromit's world. Um, Dave, thank you so much. I think we're going to invite everybody out into the foyer for, I was going to say wine, but actually it's probably cheese. Given, uh, <laughs> cheese? But, uh, I th it's just wonderful, Dave, having you here. And I'm sure we're going to have many conversations to come with you, Tristan, and all the other BSC members. So a big thank you. That was really fantastic. Well, well thank you very much for, <laughs> for watching. Thank you. Thank you for everything.